Well, good to see each and every one of you. I thought I was smarter than that, but apparently not. But I'm glad Gina came up here and helped me get that mic fixed for our uh, phone. Although this morning, apparently, I got it. Hear me even without this mic. So that was good. <clears throat> we are continuing our study on angels, uh, demons, and spiritual warfare. We've covered the basics. We've covered some things about angels. So tonight, we're looking at uh, demono <clears throat> demonology. Excuse me. The first question we should ask is, should we study demonology? Should we study demonology? I don't have a lot to say about this except yes, but we should be very careful. Demons are real and demons want to destroy mankind and disrupt God's purpose. One reason we should study demonology is because it's in the Bible. We should study the Bible. Amen. It doesn't tell us a lot about demons, so therefore we shouldn't spend an overwhelming amount of time on this. <clears throat> but if we agree we should study demonology, we need to study different types of demonology. And that is the second thing we're looking at tonight. Types of demonology. Number one, you've got your notes. If you don't, see, uh, I think Brother Rick's got a stack of them. But Bible-based demonology. What does the Bible say? At first glance, we should stay away from the study and focus on better things. There are people that spend hours and hours and hours and hours worried about this, studying this stuff, when really there are much better things we could be studying. But, again, we're going through the study because the Bible does mention it. Now, I would not do a six-month study on demonology. Actually, we're going to cover it in one night. Now, next Sunday, we will be studying um, the devil himself. But tonight is demonology. The Bible speaks of demons. So our theology must include demons. We can't say they're not real. The Bible says they're real, therefore they are real. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3.16, All, A-L-L, -L, all Scripture, everything written in, in our Bibles is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. So Paul tells us, if God put it in the Bible... It is for our profit. It's going to benefit us in some way. The Bible also tells us that we are to avoid the schemes of the devil. You'll see that in 2 Corinthians 2.11 and Ephesians 6.11. The devil and demonology, his minions, are out to um, cause chaos, panic, anxiety... You know, as human beings, there's something in each and every one of us that makes us worry. That's the reason the Bible tells us over and over and over and over, do not worry, do not be afraid, do not fear. The Bible provides examples of different types of schemes the devil uses. Number one, one thing he uses, for me and you especially, is temptation. And it's different for each and every one of us. What may tempt me may not tempt you. But temptation, again, you'll see that in Genesis 3, 1 through 7, and Matthew 4, 1 11. Another scheme is lust. You'll see that mentioned in 1 Corinthians 7 5. Another one, and I read it this morning if you paid attention, it said that a pastor can't be a novice. Why? Because he'll get the big head, he'll swell up, he'll get pride in his heart and in his life. And you may ask yourself, why would a pastor get pride? Well, if you're a young guy and they make you the spiritual leader of the church, it makes you get the big head when you, you're, 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 you don't realize that you're actually the servant of the church. You're the low man on the totem pole, according to the scripture. Uh, James 3.15 speaks of pride. Deception. Acts 5.3. False teachers, the devil has those. 
2 Corinthians 11, 13-15, and 1 Timothy 4, 1. The devil also has false religion and false beliefs. 1 Corinthians 10, 20, and Revelation 9, 20. And this is just a handful that I mentioned because the devil has multiple, multiple facets in demonology to attack us. That's his schemes. That's how he uses his demons. So after Bible-based, we now have occult-based demonology. The Bible affirms that demons are real and active, and also that witchcraft is a real phenomenon. We need to remember that. This is real. The Bible speaks of it. John warns us to test every single spirit. 1 John 4, 1 says this, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, I'm going to take just a quick moment here. You know, when I was young, I didn't understand this verse. Test the spirits. What in the world does that look like? How do we do that as a Christian? Boy, as soon as I got older and got a job and started being out in the public and the world more, man, it don't take long to test the spirits, right? Have you ever been somewhere and met someone and just something didn't feel right? That's because we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, and when it meets an unclean spirit, it lets us know pretty quick. Um, I don't have this in my notes, but I'll use this as a great example. You know, because I love supernatural things, because they can only be God, right? Um, Me and Miss Patty was here one day, been about two months ago, and this young woman came for benevolence, with a baby in her arms. Now, if you know Miss Patty and you know me, we're both pretty big hearted. But, uh, you know, she didn't want food. She didn't want gas. She wanted us to pay her cell phone bill. Well, I'm old school and I think you can live without a cell phone. I tell my kids that all the time. So, as a church, I called a deacon. And me, the deacon, and, uh, you know... The pastor and the deacon agreed we will not give her money towards a cell phone. But you know what? I felt bad for the girl. So as I was in there talking to the deacon and I hung up before she could see me, I opened up my wallet and I pulled out a $20 bill. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, put that back in your wallet. I argued for about half a second. And then I took that $20 bill and put it back in my wallet and I went and uh, told the girl, I'm like, you know, we're not going to be able to help you with this. I wish you the best. Of course, come visit us as a church. We'd love to have you. And we have yet to see her again. Sweet girl. But the Holy Spirit told me not to do that. Now, here's the weird thing. You know me, I like to talk. So as soon as she left, I looked at Patty. I said, Patty, this rarely happens with me. Rarely. If I pull out a $20 bill for benevolence, I usually give it to them. And I told Patty, I'm like, you know, I, I wanted to give her a $20 bill, but the, the, the Holy Spirit, the good Lord told me not to do that. And you know, Patty said, she did the exact same thing. She had pulled out a 20 and the Holy Spirit had told her to put her money up. So the spirits were working within us, helping guide us to what God wanted to be done. Because David wanted to give her a 20, but the Lord said, no, the Lord had something else planned. I don't know what that is. Ain't my business. But it's funny how the, the Holy Spirit was working in me, was working in Patty. Then we came together to talk about it, and you can see the way God orchestrates different things. Our spirits will test other spirits and guide us. <clears throat> we should test everything against the Word of God, especially reports of spiritual activity, as well as teachers of demonic topics or spirits. <sighs> I can't tell you, as a pastor, how many times I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, what do you think about this? Pastor, what do you think about that? You know, and the only thing I know to do is take what people tell me, take what people give me, the questions they have, and pin it up against the Word of God. Now, as far as I have seen, Outside of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when Jesus Christ walked this earth, was born, died, resurrected, and ascended. 
If you see demonic activity after that, it's very, very, very sparse. Very rare. Now, I'm not saying it don't happen. But it's not like what some people make it out to be. There's a demon around every corner. Da, 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 da. They're out to get you. And, uh, one of the questions we're going to get to is, you know, is somebody possessed? And you no know, different things like that. And we discussed this in our first lesson that in the time of Jesus' life here on earth, that was the height of spiritual warfare. Historical or sociological demonology. Christians should study the religious beliefs of other cultures. Why? This gives us the opportunity to engage those cultures with the gospel. I can't tell you how many videos and how many missionaries I've heard speak and they'll go to a different culture like say deep dark Africa. Some voodoo stuff. And they'll learn what their beliefs are and then they'll tell them what the truth is. <coughs> now we never want to belittle other people and make them look stupid or foolish but we do need to tell people the truth. And we take what they know, we take where they're at, we present the Bible and the gospel to them and show them where what they believe may not exactly be the truth. So our next question tonight, what does the Bible say about demons? What does the Bible really say about demons? Well, let's look at the Old Testament first. The Old Testament, there is not a direct word for demon in biblical Hebrew. But there are two biblical Hebrew words that refer to demons. Number one is sear. That means goat or hairy one. This is because goats were worshipped by pagan people as gods or images of gods. You'll see that in Leviticus 17.7 and 2 Chronicles 11.15. The other word you see in the Old Testament is shed, meaning false god. You'll see that in Deuteronomy 32, 17 and Psalm 106, 37. So even though the he biblical Hebrew doesn't have an exact word for demon, they do have words that refer to demons, false gods, and things of that sort. Now, the New Testament, this is where we get to the life of Jesus and the early church. The New Testament has several words that deal with demons. Number one, the actual word demon is daemon or damion. Or the word spirits, which is numinata, which also goes to our Holy Spirit. It means spirits. But you have, when you're using that word numinata, it can mean unclean spirits, akatharton, or evil spirits, which is poneron. So when you look at the spirits, they will describe them as either unclean, or evil. And of course, another word we see here could be uh, fallen, but you see the word angels, which is of course angelos. So, again, the Hebrew, not so much. The New Testament, absolutely. There's a ton of words dealing with demons. So the next question, we're going to keep on moving. There's a lot to deal with here. Are there territorial spirits. Are there territorial spirits? We kind of covered this in the introduction, but let's look at this a little bit deeper. Some scholars argue that there are spirits that hold dominion over particular geographical areas, nations, or people. There are two main texts they get their argument from. Daniel 10 and Deuteronomy 32, 8. Now let's pause. I'll be honest with you. When we look at doctrine, when we look at theology, it's hard to base a major doctrine on two sources. That's how you get in trouble. You know, if we're going to look at, you know, was Jesus God, you're going to have 20, 30, 40, 50 verses dealing with that. Not two. But there are two texts that deal with this argument. Daniel 10, we're not going to read the entire chapter. We'll look over a few things. The figures mentioned in Daniel 10 are thought to be high-ranking angels and demons called princes 
who are mentioned in verses 13, 20, and 21. And I went ahead and gave those to you in your notes. Listen to verse 13. It says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me after I had been left there with the kings of Persia. So we know Michael, right? Michael's an archangel. It calls him here one of the chief princes, one of the archangels. Daniel 10.20 He said, Do you know why I've come to see you? I must return at once to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I leave, the prince of Greece will come. So you already see here they're dealing with two different princes, two different angels over two major nations. The next verse, 1021. However, I will tell you what is recorded in the book of truth. No one has the courage to support me against those princes except Michael, your prince. So Michael is thought to be the prince over this nation. The people of God. That is who Michael is supposed to be over. You see here, this could very well mean princes and angels because these princes, Michael, are battling the other princes, the ones over Persia and this and this. And apparently somebody was strong enough and said, here, then Michael, um, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days. If someone's going to oppose Michael for 21 days, it's not going to be a normal prince or king. It's going to be another Angel, probably a fallen angel is what we're assuming here. Now let's look at Deuteronomy 32, 8. When the Most High God, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance and divided the human race, He set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the people of Israel. Okay, now that don't say much about angels, right? Now here's the thing. When you go back and look at the Hebrew text, it doesn't. We're looking at English. The Hebrew text actually translates. Some say people of Israel, but others say uh, he set the boundaries of the people according to the number of the angels of God. So basically, what people have translated those verses to say is when God decided to make all the nations. He made the exact number of nations as He had the exact number of angels to put in charge over those nations. So the argument here is that God put an angel in charge of every single nation and tribe. <clears throat> Again, we're going off one single verse. I wouldn't build a strong doctrine on that. Could it be true? Yeah. Is it possibly true? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, Satan uses his fallen angels the way God uses his angels. God uses his angels. He sent Gabriel to Mary. He sent Daniel to fight over the nation of Israel. <clears throat> We're looking at our last question tonight. We kind of went through this a little uh, quickly, but again, there wasn't a lot to cover tonight. Can Christians be demon-possessed? This is a question I get a lot. This is a question some of you may have uh, been asked before. The question is very frequent when it comes to the uh, when it comes to spiritual warfare. Can Christians be inhabited by a demon? The short answer is no, and I agree with that. I do not think Christians can be inhabited by demons. Number one, there is nothing in Scripture that shows this. There is never someone demon-possessed that's a believer. Number two, when Paul gives the gift to the church, there is no gift of exorcism. If Paul was worried about people in the church being possessed by demons, he would say there is a gift of exorcism to get those demons out. Next, Exorcism is never commanded or even mentioned in the letters to the churches. Never even mentioned. It's, it's, it's like not even a thought on Paul's radar. 
to tell the churches to worry about believers being demon-possessed. Last, but the one you can hang your hat on. Christians are inhabited by the Holy Spirit of God. So how could a demon even think about taking possession of a Christian? Jesus was very clear. There cannot be good and evil. There cannot be fresh and salt water. You cannot be a child of God inhabited by the Holy Spirit and have a demon take possession of you with His Spirit. It's impossible. It can't happen. I mean... We're looking at the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And you know the thing, I heard a professor say this, and he's absolutely right. He, he's like, go back and read the Gospels. Every time a demon speaks, their theology is 100% correct. The demons never lie. You know, they would say, um, you know, Christ the Son, have you came to... Um, judge us prior to the time. You know, they, they, would always, they, they always knew who Jesus was. They never went against Christ. They knew better. I mean, let's be honest. Jesus, at the snap of His finger, and at, just using His voice, casted out a whole herd of demons. So if we have the Holy Spirit in us. There's no way God's going to share that with a demon. Demons oppress and fight against believers. That's what they do. That's their purpose. It's not to inhabit us. It's to fight against and oppress us. We see this in Ephesians 6 and 1 Peter 5. 8. If you don't know Ephesians 6, that's the armor of God. And there's a reason Paul said put on the armor of God. He said, you're not battling with flesh. He said, you're battling with powers and principalities, dominions. And I told you in one of our first studies, those are key words there meaning spiritual forces of demonic power. Instead of possession, this is seen in deception, false teachers, and false doctrines. Demons don't have to possess us to get what they want. You let a demon get false doctrine into the local church and they win. You let a demon get someone in here teaching that Jesus truly isn't the Son of God. Now, I don't know about Oak Street. I very seriously doubt it. But you know there have been churches who's had to deal with false teachers amongst their own midst. I've heard it. I've seen it. It's a sad thing. But that's one of the jobs of the pastor is to spiritually protect the people. That's the reason it's not happened yet. I've been kind of busy sometimes. But on Sunday mornings, you know, I know none of our teachers are doing this. I'm not, I'm not that naive. I'm not that stupid. But I want to go into every one of our Sunday schools and just encourage our teachers to ask them what they need. To see what I can do for them. They've got a hard job. And I'll tell you who has the hardest job, and that's whoever's got the kids during Sunday school and children's church. I'm guessing there's probably about 20, 25 of us here. How many of you were saved over the age of 20? I see three hands. So that means the rest of us were saved in elementary, middle, and high school. That's the hard job. Now, I say this tongue-in-cheek, but I mean it. I think the children's church teachers and our children's Sunday school teachers have a harder job than I do. I mean, I want to see grown-ups saved in the congregation, but you just seen tonight, the odds are if somebody's going to hear the gospel and accept the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to happen over there. So, let's wrap this up in a nice little pretty bow.
What do we do with this information? Well, it's good theology. We learned about demons. We learned what little the Bible says about them. We learned about the schemes that they use. Uh, we learned that they can't inhabit us. So the question is, so what? <laughs> what good does that do me, Pastor? I think what we need to get out of tonight is exactly what I said this morning. I think we need to pray. I think we as a congregation need to be on guard for some of these things. Amen. You know, we don't allow just any willy-nilly person to come here. I don't allow just any willy-nilly person to get behind this pulpit. We need to safeguard the truths of the Word of God. That is where we stand. You know, anything I say outside of this is just my own opinion that don't matter. The more we stick to thus saith the Lord, the better off we'll be. So, tonight, we're getting down a few minutes early, which is fine. But we need to pray. We mentioned this morning, pray for your pastor, pray for your deacons, pray for each other. Um, we had a great great meeting at 3 o'clock with some of our children's workers, some of our youth workers. We need to be in prayer. Because I've been talking to Daniel. We've got some good ideas that we have seen work in the past, and so we know they work. And we need to be prepared for what God's about to do. And I think God's about to do something big over the next year or two. You know, one of the things we're talking about is, um, you know, maybe having something like a mom's night out. And I don't know back when you guys were parents, but if somebody offered you a free date night, you'd have probably took it in a heartbeat. I know me and Gina take it. Well, our kids went to five VBSs last year. <laughs> we take any break we can get and love it. So if we offer that to Saudi Elementary, we better be ready for 50, 100 kids to want to come hang out. And you know what? That's fine. We'll tell them about Jesus. We'll have fun. We'll encourage them to come back for vacation Bible school. And at that point, it'll already be time for Harvest Fest. But that's what you got to do. You got to reach out to your community and love on them and get them in here. So we got a lot going on in our minds. We've got a lot of plans going up in the air. Um, you know, Whatever your job was, you was trained to do it. This is what me and Daniel have been trained to do. We've been trained to reach lost communities and encourage and train our people to do the same thing. So I'm looking forward to an Easter egg hunt, to a vacation Bible school, to a harvest fast, and a, believe it or not, Christmas Eve falls on a Sunday this year. Wow. Wow. And last year, Christmas fell on a Sunday. You know, church, we got a lot of responsibility. We are ambassadors of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We need to be sharing the good news of Jesus with our lost loved ones, with our mission field across the road. That's what Saudi Elementary is. That's our mission field. I told you, it's not a coincidence God put Saudi Elementary and Oak Street Baptist Church right beside each other. I'm looking forward to seeing us grow. I'm looking forward to seeing us reach these children. I'm looking forward to seeing what God's got planned for Oak Street Baptist Church. Amen. And I'm telling you, if we're faithful and if we're obedient, we will see spiritual growth. God wants to see spiritual growth, so therefore He will bless us. We've just got to be open and willing to do what needs to be done to reach them. That's our job. Just be obedient and stay out of the Lord's way. So tonight, pray, pray, pray. Pray for God's will to be done. Pray that we stay alert as 1 Peter tells us, to be sober, to be vigilant as we see spiritual warfare start to happen in the church.
Pray that when we do see spiritual warfare, some division start to occur, that we pause. And as I'm going through the sermon series, that we stay unified. That we stay functioning towards one another. That we esteem one another highly than ourselves. Because it's going to happen. There's going to be some things... Uh, you know, like I said, if we start to grow, the devil ain't going to like it. So, as your pastor, let me encourage you to pray, to be vigilant, to be alert in what's going on, to stay unified, and to pray for your pastor, your deacons, your other leaders, and each other. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You for this study. That we don't just focus on demons for a long amount of time. But, but Father, we do realize that we are in a spiritual battle. That there are literal souls that meet Monday through Friday a hundred yards from us. And that, Father, we have an obligation to try to reach these young children in this community for You. Lord, I thank You for the Sunday school teachers that poured into me that told me about a Savior that died for me. Lord, let me be a beacon to some of these lost people. Let me tell them that yes, they have sin, but oh, they have a better Savior. Lord, be with each and every heart and mind tonight as we seek You. For it's in the precious and holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Please have a hand.